My 31M girlfriend, 26F of six years, recently quit her job to travel the world. After two months of traveling, she's considering ending things, and I'm blindsided. What now? For reference, I will call myself Michael and her Lisa. But for more info, we have had a truly wonderful relationship. We met two years before dating, and at the time I was dating someone else. Lisa was one of my flatmates at the university, I'm in the UK, and we bonded very quickly. So, we were friends for a while. My girlfriend at the time broke up with me and I had a brief fling with Lisa, no sex but kissing, etc. We were very close as friends and this felt very natural. However, I moved out a week after and moved to the other side of the country. At the time, I was in a very bad place for a variety of reasons and we slowed down talking as much. Then a year later, she randomly reached out again and we started talking, and we just reconnected completely. I was just graduating university and she was just about to enter her final year after taking a gap year for work experience. She came to visit me at the university, and at this time I fully expected it was just a friendly visit, but it quickly became more. Soon after, she was back home, and we were chatting every day for literally up to like 12 hours on FaceTime. We did it so often. I fell completely in love with her, and soon after, we became official. We've lived together for the last four years, having moved in together about six months before COVID. We had an amazing time. We adored lockdown. So much time to just develop our relationship and love each other. We have had such a wonderful relationship, always able to communicate with each other about our feelings, understand each other, and always insist on not allowing ourselves to become too codependent. We lived our own separate lives and we liked that. But when together in our flat, we lived in our own wonderful bubble full of in-jokes and words we ascribed our own meanings to. We always likened the strength of our relationship to the fact that we were friends first. No jealousy ever, rarely ever arguments, and when there were arguments, we always managed to handle it well. We've talked extensively about our future. We've said that we want to be married to each other. I have jokingly proposed to her dozens of times, always mortifying her, and have even picked out names for our future kids. We're not ready for any of that yet, as we are building our careers, but it always felt like this was it. So, she's had a job for the past two years that she ended up hating. She quit earlier this year and has been saving up to go traveling. She did the Philippines and is now in Australia. She's been there for two months now. When she first went, I told her that she needs to fully embrace it and not to worry about me. The arrangement was simple, really. Our tenancy in our flat ended at the same time she planned to travel, so I've moved in with my friend and she's away for three months. Our goal, which we discussed a lot, was that when she returns, she would find a new job. We'd find a new place and resume building our life together. Slowly, we started talking less and less, and while at first I was happy, there were little things that were ringing alarm bells. Such little things, but when you know someone so well and you know your relationship so well, these small things stand out. She'd not reply for days at a time, but still post on her Instagram story. She'd post things like feeding a wallaby, but not share that with me. I love animals, and she loves how childlike I get around them. And she always said that she feels sad seeing animals without me because she can't see my reactions to them. But now, she's not sharing them with me. I brought this up one month into her traveling, firstly framed in a I miss you kind of way, and it landed well. And she said that she would try to talk to me a bit more. But she just withdrew even more. I brought it up again two weeks later, this time with a bit more of a, maybe can we try to talk a bit more? And I also mentioned at this stage that I regret telling her before she traveled that I would be fine with not talking so much. And that while I truly meant it at the time, in action, it was hurting me more than I expected. She understood and promised that we would talk more, but we talked less. A few days ago, I bring it up again, and this time it was different. Each time, she's always insisted that she is in a bubble and that she just needs to focus 100% on the traveling. I asked her if she could just give me five minutes every few days just to say hello, but she said she wasn't sure she could even do that. This really upset me because we are six years in and we've always had such a strong relationship that I was surprised at how unwilling she was. I said we needed to talk about this properly over the phone and she suggested the following night. Her time in Australia would make it around 8 to 10 a.m. my time. I was ready at that time but she postponed it an hour and said she was going for a sunset walk and then going out for dinner with her traveling friends. Then it was postponed further but I could no longer make the call as I had a client meeting. I told her how upset I was that she prioritized a sunset walk over our relationship and that she had already had two months of them and that I was only asking for one evening so we could talk about the future of our relationship. She agreed we needed to talk about the future of our relationship but said she couldn't do that until she returned home in five weeks. 
I said I couldn't wait that long and quickly called her. My client was late, luckily. Essentially, she said that she's so confused right now because she's in a bubble of traveling, but she's just not sure if this is what she wants anymore. She floated the idea of wanting to move out to Australia. She clearly doesn't see me in her future anymore. I'm just so blindsided because we were so, so close and strong and happy before, and now she's traveled and it's just totally changed everything. I asked her if she still loves me, and she wasn't sure she could answer that. She was very much down the middle about everything, clearly confused about the situation, but not wanting to cause too much of an interference to her bubble right now. My impression was that she wanted to just ignore this was happening until she came back. So, where do I go now? I am so lost, so confused, so hurt. I want to be with her and spend my life with her, but she just might not want that now. Then, in the comments section, one user said, I mean, you guys managed to put a wonderful gloss on how great extended solo travel was going to be for both of you, but I'm afraid that was never realistic. If one person feels the need to disappear for a long period after six years, then the relationship just wasn't that strong in her mind. I couldn't imagine leaving my SO behind, that she could make me think things that weren't as rosy in her mind as they were in yours. High chance that she wanted some space from an intense relationship to think about if she was building the life she really wanted, and it seems like her answer is edging towards no. Unfortunately, it looks like heartbreak. Even if she comes back now, I am not sure that her behavior is consistent with just getting back to normal. This is certainly a possibility. She's always been passionate about traveling and did so before we met too. She lost two close grandparents two years ago and has been extraordinarily stressed about her crappy job that she had. If things weren't as rosy, I trust that she will tell me when she's home and out of her bubble. I think that there's certainly credence to this for several reasons too. The life she was living with me may be marred by her job, by the general depressing dullness of England, etc. And living such a different life while traveling in beautiful, peaceful places will reinforce that and make her associate it all with me. Update. Two weeks later. So, it was a grueling two weeks in which I took everyone's advice as well as my own judgment and didn't contact her at all. It was insanely difficult because I didn't really know anything about her perspective at all. I felt like I was in limbo. I didn't know where I stood and I didn't know where she stood. Every day was day one of grieving and the longer time went, the more difficult it became. She had acted so coldly with me regards to talking to me about what was happening and as I said in my original post, she had prioritized her traveling over my well-being and or the well-being of the relationship. It was really hurting me because she knows me well and I felt very confused and frankly traumatized that she was refusing to give me any answers. It was really driving me insane. I wasn't eating or sleeping, I wasn't working, I'm self-employed and couldn't concentrate on anything. I cried a lot. After a certain point, I decided that I couldn't continue this any longer. And although I tried to respect her need for space, I needed to respect my own need for answers. So, I reached out to her again. Two days ago, we had a long two-hour video chat. She's currently in Vietnam. She sat in the hall of a hotel and we talked openly, warmly, honestly, and in-depth about both of our feelings. There were a lot of tears. It was a very emotionally draining conversation, but it gave me a lot of answers and resolved a lot of the turbulence that I had experienced. I had written her a letter on the morning of the scheduled call and I read it out to her. I explained how she made me feel and how unempathetic I felt she was. She took this on board on a profound level and deeply apologized, and I could tell she was truly hurt with herself and that she had behaved like that. She acknowledged that she had buried her head in the sand from the feelings, and it was truly powerful to hear her be so candid. This was the girl I had fallen in love with. She was usually so empathetic, smart, sensitive, so her behavior in the past few weeks being so the opposite of that created such strange feelings inside of me. I was so glad that we were talking back on the level we were usually so good at. But, long story short, it is over. You see, I am her first boyfriend. Sure, she has slept with her fair share of lads, but I'm her first relationship. We met when I was 22 and she was 18. I was really the only man in her life for a long time. She's now traveling and just feels a deep sense within herself that she needs to explore herself and her life without a partner. She needs to be able to do this alone. I completely understand this. It's not what I wanted to hear, but it's something I obviously understand. It won't at all stand in the way of. She's planning to move to Australia for a while and continue her soul search. Right now, she just doesn't see a place for me and what she needs from her life. It's heartbreaking. I'm heartbroken. I love her deeply. She still loves me, but sometimes that just isn't enough, and that's all there really is to it. 
A lot of you suggested, sometimes with quite a cruel snarkiness, that she was cheating. She wasn't. I'm sure some of you will still believe that, but that's fine. Maybe you just haven't been in a real adult relationship where there is honesty and transparency. This is not about another man. This is just about her recalibrating on what she wants from her future. Now, I need to figure out how to recalibrate my future. We had talked extensively about marriage. I was ready to spend my life with her. We had already named our future kids. Everything about the future that we had envisioned is now gone. It is really difficult right now to imagine being with anyone else because the depth of our relationship was so strong. Every night, I am awoken by the isms of our relationship. The small quirks, the in-jokes, the made-up language we would use, the tone of voice we would speak to each other in, the food we'd eat together, the things we'd do together, the songs we'd sing together, our touch, the warmth of her body against mine, the smell of her perfume, the way she would say my name in a cute way when I had done something cheeky, so many things that are are littering my mind right now. I'm struggling to see through it right now, and I have no idea how I will make it through. If anyone can share any advice that can help me, please do. I know the obvious stuff, the gym, focus on yourself, rebuild your life, but they are all intangible to me. How do I repair my soul? How do I move on from someone I am still actively in love with? She returns to the UK at the start of July, and I will be spending a few days with her. A goodbye, if you will. It will be hard, and every fiber of my being wants to beg her to find a way to include me in her future or to find ways to entertain the notion that, in the future, we will find our way back to each other in some grandose, fatalistic stroke. I had truly defined her as my soulmate and my best friend, and she had done the same for me. Right now, while she's still traveling, she's not able to sit in any of these feelings, but I know they will come for her too when she returns to her parents and lives there for six months, as she saves for her future traveling. I don't know what the future looks like now. If anyone has any advice, please do let me know. It's over, but in a somewhat beautiful and amicable way. I'm heartbroken and sad. How do I heal? So, OP made a really well put together statement or question and he said, you know, I know I have to go to the gym, focus on myself, rebuild my life, but those are intangible. How do I repair my soul? Man, that hits deep. And unfortunately, with heartbreak, I'm sure we've all experienced it in some way or another. It takes time. It's not something you can do, you know, you can drink your problems away, but then they're still there the next morning. You can ignore it and turn your attention to someone else. You can immediately jump into another relationship, but those emotions will catch up to you. And it's, it's just a time thing. Thing, unfortunately. It sucks, but that's unfortunately the truth. That's how it works. And, you know, OP dated someone so young that for her, she or he was all she knew. Then she saw something else and was like, well, maybe what we have isn't what I want. And we've seen that a lot of times on this channel where a relationship between two people, two young adults, or one young adult, and as time goes on, one or both of the young adults realize that you are the only thing I know, but I know right now that I probably don't want you. And unfortunately, that tends to happen. But anyway, next story. Story number two. Final update to, I am 22 years old and just got the news I am dying. I failed at life and now I am leaving behind a three-year-old daughter. As the title says, last week I got the news that I am dying from lung cancer from my doctor. Turns out smoking since I was 15 and then upping it to three packs each day a few years was a bad idea. Stupid, I know. I thought it wouldn't come so soon though. It's stage four and as of now I have months to live. Please don't feel bad for me. I've done nothing good in life except have my daughter to really be sad about losing me. I have no family because I grew up in the foster system and aged out at 18. My daughter's father is in prison for serious crimes that even if he got out, he wouldn't be allowed to be in her life. My daughter is only three. We don't live in a good area, and when I go to work, I have to leave her with an elderly neighbor that always gets her name wrong every day. I don't want her to grow up like I did, in that foster care system. I feel like it's the only reason why I messed up and did nothing good with my life. Yeah, I know it's not the only reason, and my own stupidity caused most of my issues, but if I just had some family or a support system to help keep me in check, it could have been better. I just want to give her some chance to have a better shot than I did. The thing is, I do have an idea for who could take care of her. One of my closest friends is a co-worker at my job, and she's amazing. While I'm at the bottom of the job, like if they need to lay off people, I would definitely be the first to go. She's their prized worker and makes serious bank. She has a good husband and a kid. I want to ask her if she would be okay with adopting my little girl once I'm gone, but I know it won't go well. The thing is, my co-worker and her family are black, and me and my daughter are white. 
Like we both have blue eyes and can't tan white. There is no way I can ask my friend to adopt my daughter and force her to deal with those kind of issues an adoption like that will bring to her family. But then that just leaves my little girl to grow up like I did, in a crappy system with only a will of about a thousand dollars to help her and a necklace my mother had that I'm going to give her. I don't know if I should bite the bullet and ask my close friend if she is willing to take my daughter, or just suck it up and try to work as hard as I can to get as much money into my will for my girl. But either way, I failed as a mother. And that is a regret I am literally taking to my grave. Edit. Okay, I reached out to her and we were able to set up a place to meet. It's some simple cheap bakery you can eat inside. I'm going to ask her if she can adopt my daughter. That way, if she says no, I can have more time to go to an adoption agency near us. Thank you for the support, everyone. Update. Alright, I'm back now. A day after my post, I was able to meet up with my friend slash coworker. And after telling her about my diagnosis, which is something I haven't told anyone at work, I asked her if she was willing to adopt my little girl. She was shocked and tried to comfort me about my upcoming death, but she told me she couldn't give me her answer right then and there. Turns out, she does want a daughter, but something happened in her second pregnancy and caused her issues. I don't feel right sharing it, though. So, she does want to consider adopting, but first, she needed to talk to her husband and talk about planning if he agrees. I understand, since it was a big change in their family. I said okay, and after we ate, she gave me a hug and told me she will miss me. This is embarrassing, but I actually started crying. I also started making emails. Someone gave me this idea, and I thought it was amazing. So, I created an email for my daughter and started pre recording videos for stuff. It's nowhere near ready, but I already have some ideas and recorded some videos for her birthdays and some big life events like first crushes and prom and first job. Sad to say, but I realized planning it that most of the videos will be don't do what I did. My friend reached out to me a few days ago and said that after having a long talk with her husband, they both are considering it. Apparently, they do this thing where after talking about a huge change in their lives, they'll come to something to agree on, and then wait for a while, and if they're still on the same page, then it sounds like a good idea. She did tell me that it wasn't a yes, though. There are some issues they want to fix first. She said that while they both really like the idea, they barely know anything about my little girl. Her husband and six-year-old son haven't seen her, and while she has seen and heard about her, it's from me. So, she told me about a plan they came up with. For the rest of this month, I'm going to have to get up two hours earlier than normal to drop my daughter off at their house so her husband can watch over her as he works at home. Then I'll go to work with my coworker. This way, her husband and son can get to know her. She also said she wants us to celebrate Christmas with them, so that's something to look forward to in the future. I've already done it yesterday, and when I went to go pick up my little girl, she was the happiest I've ever seen her in a long time. My friend's husband said that they went off on the wrong foot in the start. He said she was really scared sometimes and didn't want to play with her son yet, but since it was their first day, he thinks that she'll get better. We did it again today, and he said she mostly watched their son play, but it was already better than yesterday. So, that's what's happening right now. I'm scared, though, that this will be for nothing. But at the very least now, my daughter is getting better at their house. So even if they say no in the end, she already has some better memories than she was with me. Now, here are some relevant comments. User 1 said, Sending you so much love, sweetheart. I hope you're able to enjoy your little girl and find peace knowing she'll be with a loving family. And even if it ends up not working out, you did and are doing your best to provide her with the best possible future. Just a recommendation with the email, get a backup or backups for the videos, be it a CD, USB, online backup, or others. I have an email I use to receive only, and it goes directly to my mail app on iPhone, so I don't directly log into the account on Gmail. But anyway, I got an email some time ago that since there's been no activity on the email for a few years, that the account would be closed in a few months. So I just sent myself a few emails, but it may happen, so please get a backup, because she'll definitely appreciate it. Thank you. I'll try to do some backups for any videos I record. And I think if my friend says yes after all of this, I will tell her about the email deletion so she could help stop that from happening. That does scare me that she could lose all the emails before even seeing them. Then user 2 commented and said, I know I'm only an internet stranger, but as a mom, I am proud of you. You don't have much, but everything you do is focused on your baby girl, and that's what makes a great mom. One thing I will say to add to the email idea, if you can, grab some loose sheets of paper or a small notebook and write down your favorite recipes, including all the things you add that make it something only you've made. Give that to her because one day she'll be able to happily say, I made mom's food. 
Write down happy little things you come across in the time you have left. Not in email form, but in your own handwriting because she'll treasure that in years to come, and it's a tangible link to you. Write down places you like to go, favorite color, favorite music, things like that. Little pieces of you so she'll have something to physically hold on to when times get hard. You have all my love. I was thinking of writing a letter for my little girl's 13th birthday. The only thing I have for my mom is this necklace that has been with me. I don't know what it is, but it has a lot of curls and hoops with a pretty almost clear clear stone in the middle. I was going to write a letter explaining the necklace is from her grandmother, and now since she would be old enough, it's going to be hers. I do have recipes that I know she loves, and that would be an amazing idea. She loves my egg salad sandwiches, so that's one recipe I will write down. Thank you for the idea. Update number two. I'm back again. I'm sorry for being gone so long. A lot has happened, and this will be my last post. So, this is going to be long. Sorry. First, I started feeling real sick days after Christmas. My whole chest was hurting like something was hitting it with a hammer over and over, and I was coughing up blood. My best friend was terrified that I caught something, because the doctors have said that me getting sick right now could be deadly, so we had to go to the doctor. Thankfully, I didn't get anything. It was the symptoms getting worse. Also, thankfully at the time, I was still at work, so I didn't have to pay much for the bills. And yeah, that was another terrible thing that happened to me recently. After that trip to the hospital, my work called me privately. Remember how I said that if something were to happen, I would be the first to go? Guess what? The bosses were telling me how they couldn't keep me there as I'm dying because it wouldn't feel right and how it's apparent to them my illness was slowing me down and forcing my co-workers to work harder to make up for me, and it wouldn't be fair and all that. I know I was just causing more problems to my co-workers since I got diagnosed, but I didn't think they would complain about me to my bosses. I'm so stupid for that. Of course, I was being a pain. I was hoping to still be with them to the end of the month so I could pay my apartment rent. And I had barely enough money for bills, rent, groceries, public transport, and hospital bills. This is where my best friend slash former co-worker comes in. After testing out caring for my little girl for a few weeks and spending a big holiday with them, she and her husband agreed to adopt her. She was telling me about some of her plans and I told her it would probably be for the best that my daughter moves in with them. She asked why and I told her our work fired me and I couldn't be able to care for both of us with so little money. She told me we both could move in with them and that they have plenty of guest rooms that I could pick out. I swear I tried to say no. Her family was already doing so much for us and I felt like this was too much. She told me I could be a huge help for them living there during my last few months. Her husband could use the help looking after her as he works, and I can help them decorate and fix up her new room, show them the foods my daughter likes to eat. So I promise I'm not going to be a bother to them, and we are hard at work getting the needed papers together for the adoption after I'm gone. And guess how rich her family is? They have a personal family lawyer. When I haven't been feeling sick, we've been working with him to make sure the adoption goes through. And okay, after all of that, I do want to share some other fun news. Christmas with them was probably the best Christmas my daughter and I have ever had our entire lives. My friend's family had like five Christmas trees in their entire house. Thanks to my friend, I was able to make a really special Christmas gift for my daughter, Hey Build-A-Bear. Well, it was really a big bunny, but still. I made a voice recording telling her how much I love her and will always try to keep her safe. And my friend knows about the emails too. I'm almost done with them actually, just a few more left. I gave her the password to both the email and this Reddit account, so once I pass, she could delete this one. Sorry, but I've been getting so many messages and I don't want people to message me when I'm gone. And about the messages, I've gotten a lot since I updated. Apparently my story was shared on TikTok. That's cool. It's weird I've gotten so many people reaching out to me and messaging me once to talk. I've never had that happen in my life. It's funny how it happens once I'm dying. Tons saying how if my friend said no, they would love to adopt my little girl. Thank you, but thankfully my friend did say yes. But if you still want to adopt, please reach out to a foster care system in your state. There are still children struggling in the system going through what I did. Give those kids the life I could never have. I've also had some saying how they would love to pay me money to help. Please don't bother. Sorry, but it feels weird accepting money. My whole life I have worked for everything I've had, so it feels wrong accepting money and help from strangers just because I'm dying. I do want to address a few messages I've gotten about race. Most were about why I cared about my friend's family and me and my daughter's race being different. It wasn't a lot, but a few called me a racist for caring about that. I want to say that my nerves about that isn't because I think me and my daughter being white makes us different than my friend. Far from it. I've seen a lot of stuff in the system and talked about with other kids of different races. And those kids of different races were put into care with people who were also a different race from them. They would tell me the problems they faced from the parents. Not that I'm scared my friend will do that, but also from the outside world. Being called names and insulted. 
One kid told me how she got screamed at by some older lady at a restaurant, and the parents did try to get involved, and it got into a nasty fight. So yeah, I was scared her family and my daughter would face the same bigotry the foster kids I knew from before faced. But I can't let my fears about some bigots ruin my daughter's chances. Anyways, this will be the last time I'm going to probably post on here. I don't want to waste my last days. I thought about taking up painting again, actually. I used to paint when I was in high school before I dropped out. And once in the same school, we read a classic book about a world where books are banned. I don't remember a lot from the story, but I do remember at the ending when a character said, you didn't waste your life when you make something to leave behind. That always stuck with me. I want to paint something. Maybe my friend could hang it up or keep it in their attic. But as long as I've left something behind, my life wasn't for nothing, right? I also need to help my friend's family and my daughter settle into their new lives. Thank you to everyone for your kindness and goodbye. Then in the comments section, one user said, What about your daughter's other parent? Grandparents? I'm sorry this is happening, but please consider family first. Her father is in prison for hopefully a very long time because he did a crime involving children. So even if he got out, he would not be allowed near her. Not like I would want him to. And my parents are dead. Final update. She's resting now. I've wrote and deleted this post so many times. She asked me to update for all of you when she passed, and yet I couldn't until now, and for that I'm sorry. We buried her two weeks ago. My co-workers, our family, and even some friends that she made over her life that she managed to keep in touch with showed up to her funeral. When she saw the prices of what a casket and a plot of land in the cemetery would cost, she had a panic attack, and so we told her we'll go with the cheapest prices. We lied about that. She deserves a good funeral and a nice resting place. Her name was Michelle. She was put into the foster care system when she was three years old after her mother passed away in a car accident. She never knew her father. When she was 16, the man who was supposed to be taking care of her took her out of high school. She found out she was pregnant from him when she was 18, and it was discovered he had horrible images and videos of children on his computer, and so he was arrested. Ever since, she was working and doing her damn best to make ends meet for her and her daughter. She got a job at our workplace just a few weeks after she turned 19. I only discovered just a few months months ago that she actually lied to get the job. I asked Michelle why she did that, and she responded, Why would it be a big deal? They taught me everything anyways. That is the Michelle I know. It shocks me reading over her messages she left behind, how little she thought of herself. She was always so confident, at least that's how we all saw her. She walked with her head held high and with a purpose. She never appeared out of control of a situation, except for the past few months, and honestly, I believe she was allowed to have moments of panic and grief. Nothing went past her, too. She seemed to know everything that was going on around her at all times. It also seemed like Michelle wasn't afraid of anything. She even made friends with some homeless people around the areas she lived in before moving in with us. One of them was Ted, who she knew because he was around a gas station besides the bus stop. Before her cancer took a turn for the worst and she was taken to a hospital, she asked me to drive her there. I thought at the time she wanted to see some familiar sights, but instead she walked into the gas station, bought a sandwich, and then walked around the side and handed it to who I learned was Ted. Ted showed up to her funeral. I don't want to describe her last few weeks when she was alive. It was in the hospital and she was so weak and frail, just not like her. We visited her as much as we could. Our children hated seeing her in such a state, though. All of us did. But we couldn't just ignore her and leave her behind. I wonder if it was the right thing to do, though. Our last visit, I just had a feeling it was the end. She was asleep when she finally passed on. She had gladiolus and poppies at her funeral. And we all loved the meeting behind the gladioli flower. And she picked poppies because she loved calling our daughter her little poppy. We painted the little poppies on her bedroom walls. She keeps asking us where her mother is, and always sleeps with the bunny Build-A-Bear that Michelle made. Michelle never got to finish her painting, but I think that's what makes it more special. We're gonna hang it up in our daughter's room when she gets older. The emails are finished, and she's going to see her first one on her fourth birthday. We have all the letters and recipes she was able to write down tucked away in a safe location. Like the painting, we'll give them to her as she grows older. We were also able to apply our daughter for full Social Security Survivor's benefits, and we'll be putting those into a savings account for future college or life use. That's all I can think of right now. According to Michelle's wishes, I will be deleting this account in a few weeks. My husband and I promise we will raise our daughter to the very best we can and make sure she is as loved as Michelle loved her. Thank you for all your kind words and support. Rest in peace, Michelle. Story number three. 
Am I the a-hole for refusing to jump the broom at my wedding? Hi there, everyone. I am 33F, and I am black, and I am soon to be married to 29M, white. We're getting married in October, and we've been together for three years, engaged for one. I was born and raised in Kenya, and I moved to the States to attend university. My fiancé is from the West Coast, Wyoming, and his parents still live there. My fiancé and his parents don't have the best relationship. I've only met them a few times since we've been together. His mother always asks to come visit, but my fiancé finds excuses to stop her from coming. He's very introverted and his mother and father are a lot personality wise so i understand why he keeps his distance after hearing about our engagement my fiance's mother insisted on helping with the decorations for the wedding she's an interior designer and i told her that she could design the centerpieces but everything else would be handled by the wedding planner she begrudgingly agreed and i thought that was the end of it she flew in a few weeks after that to discuss wedding plans she showed me a few of her centerpiece designs and then showed me the real reason why she came the brooms at first, I didn't understand why she was showing me a bunch of elaborate brooms. She had a whole file showcasing about 50 types of brooms. I kept thinking that the venue we had chosen didn't need fancy brooms everywhere because it's a modern venue. The brooms really wouldn't fit into the theme that we were going for. I guess she saw the confusion on my face because she asked if I had already had a broom in mind because she was really hoping we could pick one out together. I told her that the cleaning staff at the venue would do an excellent job beforehand, so bringing a broom would not be necessary. She laughed and said, I'm talking about picking out a broom to jump over during the ceremony. I am not normally this dense. I know the history of jumping the broom in african-american history but i'm from kenya we don't jump the broom in kenya and i would feel uncomfortable jumping the broom because it's not a part of my culture and my fiance is very white i just didn't think that my white mother-in-law would be so insistent on us jumping the broom she was downright beaming when she showed me more broom photos i told her that i was uncomfortable with jumping the broom and gave her my reasons my fiance stepped in and said that he was uncomfortable as well. His mother was pissed. She said the whole reason she came out here was to pick out brooms, and now our wedding won't have any culture. I told her that we could incorporate some of my tribe's traditions if she wanted to add some culture into my wedding, and I mentioned the Kenyan choir that was going to be singing at our wedding, not to mention the very traditional food that would be served. But she wouldn't budge on that broom, and how without it, we were turning our backs on my culture. I finally snapped and told her that we could always go the dowry route. Her side of the family could scrounge together a few goats and some cows, and we'd call it even. She turned red and stomped off. She left after a day of the silent treatment. I thought she would cool down a bit and we could be cordial. My fiancé told me that would never happen, and he was right. A few weeks ago, my fiancé's mother made a post on Facebook. She decided to make her own custom broom herself and made a post on Facebook condemning me and my refusal to jump the broom. She went on and on about how I was turning away from my roots and how she slaved for weeks on a broom that will never be jumped over. I have received countless messages from her friends and family calling me an a-hole. My fiancé's dad has called my fiancé and I ungrateful. My fiancé is livid and wants to boot her out of the wedding and cut contact but now most of his side is refusing to come to the wedding to show solidarity with his mother. So, am I the a-hole? Now here are some relevant comments. User 1 said, Not the a-hole. Respond to her Facebook post and tell her that you are confused about her desire to embrace your culture, but your family is all from Kenya. That and the fact that you are also from there. And it is an insult to ask you to jump a broom when this is not your culture and never has been. As well, that jumping the broom is a black American culture. That you were more than happy not to force your fiancé's family to provide a dowry in order to marry you as is your cultural tradition. I'd even throw in drinking goat blood just to gross her out, but broom jumping has nothing to do with your traditions for thousands of years. And it is insulting to not only you but the rest of your family, and you are sure that the last thing she would want is to offend half the people attending the wedding. You are absolutely right. I've decided to sit down in a few hours and just bear it all out there in a Facebook post. I'm ready to just go full scorched earth at the moment. I'll even be petty and include the fact that she wished me a happy Kwanzaa for the last two years, even though I've told her numerous times that my family celebrates Christmas. The weird thing is, is that she has never asked me anything about my culture. I've offered to show and tell her a few things about it, but I think once my fiancé told his mother that I was black and from Kenya, she heard African American and just said F it to the Kenyan part. Then user 2 commented and said, Not the a-hole. Don't be a pushover, especially when your husband is having your back. That would make you the a-hole. Listen to your gut. It's your wedding. Who cares who goes? Your husband clearly loves you. You're marrying him, not others, and if that matters more to you, you should not be getting married.
I do love him. I just didn't want to be the one that finally caused him to cut ties with his family, especially right before our wedding. It's why I've been in the mode of keeping the peace instead of a more confrontational mode. My fiancé and I talked about all of this last night, and he told me that this incident was just the straw that broke the camel's back. He says he has no problem cutting ties with his family, and honestly, that has been such a relief to hear. And finally, user 3 commented and said, Okay, she complained that she slaved over making the broom? She is embarrassing herself. She doesn't understand the difference between African American and African? You can make a response that jumping the broom is an American tradition rooted in our nation's history. It is very sad how she thought she was being so progressive that she knew about jumping the broom to now lecturing you about being a POC. It took her forever to understand that I was actually born and raised in Kenya. She thought I took an ancestry DNA test, which showed that I have Kenyan roots. I have a slight accent that gets stronger if I get emotional or if I talk with certain people. I guess she didn't hear the accent when I first met her, which probably strengthened her belief in me being born and raised in the U.S. It wasn't until I pulled out my passport and talked about 90% of my family still living in Kenya that things started to click for her a little, but not everything, obviously. Update. Hi everyone, it's been about a week and a half since my first post, and a few things have happened. I want to thank everyone who responded and commented on my last post. Everyone was so nice and helpful, which helped me solidify the fact that I was not an a-hole. I decided to be petty last week, so I sat down and wrote a rebuttal post to my future mother-in-law's Facebook post about my refusal to jump over her customized handmade broom that she slaved over for weeks. A lot of people who commented on my last post clocked over the slaved over line that she used. I went back and counted the times she used the word slaved in her Facebook post. She used the word over 10 times. Her post was only two paragraphs long. I won't write my full post here, but I touched on me being Kenyan and not African American several times, in caps. I decided to tag all of her friends, family that had sent me private messages condemning my refusal to jump over her custom broom. I reiterated the fact that in my tradition of my tribe, a dowry would be expected from the groom's family. I mentioned that they could send their goats, cows, and chickens to my future mother-in-law's house if they felt so inclined to make a contribution. I also wrote the post in both English and Swahili to really hammer down the point that I'm from Kenya. And I may or may not have called my future mother-in-law a racist cow at the end. In a polite way though. Since my Facebook post, all hell has broken loose. I knew that my post wouldn't win any of my fiance's family over to my side, but I didn't realize that my future mother-in-law had so much pull. After my post, I blocked and unfriended all of my fiance's family minus a few family members who had always been in my corner. I had only added most of them because of the wedding anyway, so no love lost there. A few days later, my fiance's sister texted me and told me that her mother had doubled down. She recruited a bunch of her family and friends to make their own brooms in solidarity with her? There are about seven brooms in total now, all made from different family members, I guess to make my mother-in-law feel better? I've seen pictures, and they're all horrendous. One of them says, future mother-in-law is not a racist on the handle. Oh my goodness. She has been calling and texting my fiancé nonstop since my Facebook post, and so has his dad. But he has not given them the time of day. He sent them one text telling them that they've gone too far and he needs space. Lots of space. As for the upcoming wedding, we have decided to accept my fiancé's family's plan to boycott. Most of their invitations have been revoked, including the invitations extended to my future mother-in-law and father-in-law. They'll probably still show up to the wedding, but we have security. My fiancé and I have decided to go low contact with his side of the family. He has muted and blocked his parents and slowly moved to no contact in a few months. Now, here are some more relevant comments. User 1 said, Not the a-hole. I would totally give you a fainting goat for your dowry. Who needs another broom? I will never understand why people have such a hard time with other cultures and refuse to learn new things when they are wrong slash don't know about the culture. I hope your wedding is beautiful and peaceful. Then user 2 replied and said, Exactly. I am Kenyan. We don't jump any brooms here. Dowry is a thing, though. The day of the wedding, the groom's family goes to the bride's family's home to convince them to let them take her to the wedding. This is done with a lot of song and jest. Also, we have 42 tribes and each tribe has different ways of doing things. What I described is from the Kikuyu people. It is only a snapshot. Mother-in-law should have sat OP down and asked her about her culture in the first place. Wow, what a coincidence. I am Kikuyu. 
I tried to be vague on here regarding the dowry requirements, but yes, this is all true. I tried to sit down with my future mother-in-law and talk about my culture, but she wouldn't have it. Her mind was set on me and her very white son jumping the broom. So, um, OP, you're, yes, you're black, but you're doing it wrong. Can you do it this way, please? I'm begging of you. Actually, I'm demanding of you. Look at this broom I made. I slaved, slaved, slaved to make this broom for you. And so did all the other rednecks. Come on, guys. I'd like to imagine it's like Plankton's family from SpongeBob when they all showed up. This feels like either someone is being so progressive that it loops back to racism, or someone who is just so racist they're poorly trying to cover it up. Will you do this American tradition? No. Will you do this American tradition? No. Will you do this American tradition? No. <laughs> I make myself laugh. Anyway, next story. Story number four. New update nine months later to, am I the a-hole for telling my parents that they were horrible and saying they shouldn't have more kids? Hi there, first time posting. I, 16M, was born when my parents were very young. Like my mother was 16 and my father was 17. Both families decided it would be the best for me if effectively my maternal grandparents raised me and my biological parents got to live their lives. That is not to say I didn't know who my actual parents were. This is not one of those situations like in movies where the mother pretends the daughter's child is actually her own. I and everyone know who my progenitors were. My father moved away when he was 18, but my mother remained in my grandparents' house until she was 23, and I was around 7, but that doesn't mean we were close. She always treated me more like an annoying little brother rather than a son. She didn't like spending time with me, never attended any of my school functions or showed interest in my academic work or took me to do any fun activities. Whenever I was talking about my day, she would roll her eyes or change the topic to shut me up. When she moved out, I barely saw her. She just came to family gatherings and said awkward hellos and not even look at me. It hurt. Even by that point, I already considered my grandparents to be more my parents than her. My father was still living away. They weren't together at this point, but would come once or twice a year to visit his own family around the holidays and always made it a point to visit me and take me to do some sort of fun activities like going to the cinema or my favorite restaurant. Things like that, but to me, he was more like a strange man than a dad because when I compared him to my friend's fathers who picked them up from school every day and went to their games and played with them on the weekends, I didn't understand why this man, who I saw maybe twice a year, was supposed to be the same. Anyway, fast forward to a year ago. My father moved back to the same city where we live. He tried to hang out with me more often, but I wasn't really interested, although sometimes I complied. I don't hate him, I just don't know him. I even had a bedroom in his apartment, which is cool because he lives in the center of the city. Behind everyone's backs, both my parents had started hanging out a couple of times a month. Later, they announced they were dating. It was a shock. They asked me to move in with them to my father's apartment, which I refused, but they argued that we could finally be a family. I was about to start an argument on them when my grandma just said that changing school districts would be very inconvenient and I could lose all my friends and the situation de-escalated by itself, although my parents didn't let go of the idea. My parents asked me to spend more time with them and this was particularly frustrating because even though I never had any particular tension with my father, I most definitely do with my mother. I do not like being around her and she's treated me poorly my whole life and I feel like she's now only trying to save face because she knows my dad wants me there. But now, on to the issue. Last week, they both came into my grandparents' house. They announced they were going to buy a house nearby in the neighborhood so that I can finally move in with them. I immediately said no when they said that changing schools would no longer be an issue. And I found myself in a corner, and I said that was never the problem, and that I just simply don't see them as my parents and don't want to live with them. That's when they dropped the bomb on us. Not only did they want me to move in with them so we could be a family, but my mother was pregnant, so we were going to be an even bigger family. I was shocked and I blew my lid on them. I told them they were the worst parents in the world and that they abandoned me for 16 years and now they were going to bring another child into the world and do the same to them? And they never apologized for treating me like garbage and like a mistake they made and making me feel like I wasn't supposed to exist and dumping me to be other people's responsibility. And only now that they feel like they care, they want to be my family. My mother screamed back at me, telling me I was a brat and that she wasn't going to make the same mistakes twice, raising her second baby. And I told her she never raised me to begin with. And my father said that they were young and trying to do the best that they could. Well, guess what? The best you could do was pretty effing bad. 
I stormed out and went to my room sobbing. I have been very depressed for the last week, and they have both called and texted me since, but I have ignored them. My grandparents agree with me that I shouldn't move, and that my parents shouldn't expect me to be all loving and forgiving after how they've treated me. However, they believe they are starting a new chapter of their lives now, so they are more mature and stable, which I guess leaves me behind. I've also had time to think that I am the same age my mother was when she had me and what a huge responsibility that must have been. But I still can't forgive them. So, am I the a-hole for the way I reacted to the news? Edit. Thank you everyone for the verdict of not the a-hole. I feel better and it has somewhat cleared my mind. Also, huge, huge thank you to all of you that are commenting about how awesome my grandparents are. I'm planning on showing them this post so they can see how much everyone can see the amazing kind of people they are, and they deserve all the love and appreciation I could possibly give them and more. I've also come to the conclusion that I have a lot of resentments and unanswered questions as well as misgivings about the future that I need to set straight with primarily my father. He needs to know how I grew up and I need to know why he abandoned me. I also feel like I need to warn him about my mother because I am worried about my sibling being abandoned and mistreated like I was. So I'm preparing a list of points and questions that I want to bring up to him and we will meet tomorrow or the day after. And I'll confront him with all of these to hopefully get some sort of closure or resolution. Then. In the comments section, OP elaborated more on the relationship with his mom and dad and said, My father really, really wants us to be a happy family. When the three of us are together, you can see him beaming with joy. Like, he can't actually stop himself from smiling and making comments like, This is everything one could possibly want, and stuff like that. I think probably my mother has told him a completely different story on what our relationship was like growing up when he left, and he doesn't seem to notice the tension between me and her. As far as my living arrangements, they would have to pull me screaming out of my grandparents, and they signed away their parental rights sometime after I was born, so I don't think they even have a legal foot to stand on if it came to that but I just hope they can come to respect my decision. Then one user commented and said, OP, when you're ready, consider meeting your dad alone to find out information from him. I was thinking that too. I want to have a conversation with my father mostly about my concerns about my mother and what to do moving forward. The more I think about this, the more I'm scared about my little sibling because I'm not sure how my mother would take care of them. I'm starting to feel like there's a lot of things that I don't know about the time when I was born and why I was effectively abandoned because my other set of grandparents, paternal, don't live far away and I see them occasionally but it's always more uncomfortable with them. They have other children and grandchildren whereas my mother is an only child so when I visit them, them, I feel like the odd one out because I'm usually alone in a big family environment. But about why my dad didn't reach out to me, I don't know and I want to confront him about that. As far as I'm aware, when he was away, he didn't keep much contact with my mother either. This is just since he came back. That's why I feel like I need to talk with him and set things straight because I feel so lost, honestly. Update. Three days later. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for the responses. It really helped a lot. It's been an emotional couple of days, and a lot has happened. My mind is a little bit dispersed, but I feel like I owed you all an update, and I'm going to try and give you one and be as clear as possible. First of all, I shared my post with my grandparents, and they were so surprised by it. It. They were very happy to see how many people commented about how amazing they are, and I, in turn, also took the opportunity to tell them how much I loved them and how much I appreciated everything they have ever done for me. They are my real parents, and nothing is ever going to change that. There were some tears, and they told me they loved me and how proud they were of me. They never thought of themselves of doing something special or worth so much appreciation. They were just taking care of family, but they are the best. After that, I started trying to collect my thoughts and arranging a meeting with my father to discuss the things that were bothering me. Why did he abandon me? Why did he think he could just reappear into my life like that? That I wasn't going to move in with them and I didn't consider them my parents because they never acted as such, etc. We met at a park and he went to hug me but I stepped away and he looked hurt and he just apologized for what happened the other day. And he went into this speech about how we could try to transition into living together part-time and respect my boundaries and I went blank. I didn't expect for him to talk so I pulled out my phone and just showed him the post I made the other day and he started reading it in silence. After a while, he read it all, and some responses, and he just asked me if this was true, and I said yes. And he asked me if I had questions, and that he would answer them honestly. I asked what happened when I was born, and he told me that when my mother got pregnant, all options were laid on the table. Abortion, adoption, marriage, Gramps taking care of me, only one of my parents taking care of me. My mother was deadly scared of abortion, because some religious groups had told them some horror stories about dead babies and mothers being killers or some BS like that, so she wanted to give me up for adoption, but my father refused. He couldn't bear the idea of having his child living somewhere 
somewhere and never seeing him again, so he proposed taking me in as sole caretaker and leaving his college plans to stay in our city, but his parents weren't thrilled with this plan and pushed him to go to college so he could provide economically for me. They offered themselves to take care of me, but they were significantly older than my maternal grandparents. She was an only child, and at the time, they were just 40, whereas my father has five older siblings and his parents were already in their 60s. And since taking care of me meant taking care of my mother for a while as well, my maternal grandparents decided it was the best decision for them to take me in. Also, intermediately after I was born, my mother had postnatal depression, and the doctors advised them to not completely remove me from her side, or more damage to our relationship could be done. And my grandparents wanted her to eventually love me as a son. One thing to note about my father that I didn't mention in my original post is that even when he was in college, he worked part-time to pay child support. And once he started working in a law firm, he started sending more money to my grandparents and set up a college fund for me, which was news for me. My grandparents don't know about this, but my mother does, so I don't know what to do of this information. My father thought of me all the time he spent away and believed he had left me with a happy family and that he was working to give me a better life. But I followed his life through social media. He went to parties, vacations, had girlfriends, and did a lot of fun stuff and barely had any contact with me. I asked him why couldn't he have made some more effort and try to be a part of my life. Like, I understand if he needed to study in another city and work there, but it's no effort to call or text. Coming once a year just doesn't cut it. He looked ashamed and apologized to me, and I took the advice that I saw in a lot of the comments here that I would forgive, but not forget, and that maybe we can build a relationship going forward, but they will always be marked by their actions in the past. If he hasn't been my dad for 16 years, he can't start now. He seemed sad, but accepted my conditions. I then told him about my concerns regarding my mother. I told him how bad she treated me as a child, that I did not think she would be a good mother for my sibling, and that I wanted to go low or no contact with her. He said that after he left for college and they broke up, he would call her once in a while to check in on things, but that quickly ended when he came back and she explained to him that her and I had a great bond, and even though we didn't see each other daily, it was because I was in those teenage years, and that she loved spending time with me and was a very hands-on mom. I told him that all that she said was a lie, and that she never cared for me. He obviously read the stuff from my post, but I also told him other things, like she would ask my grandparents for babysitting money, for taking care of me, or that she would call me annoying or disgusting to my face when we lived together, and that severely messed me up. He was very serious and said he would talk to her, but that he really would not allow a child to be treated like that, and that he was sorry for letting that happen to me. Lastly, he told me I would have a bedroom in his house, but he understood perfectly that I would never live there. He was quite emotional at this point and got choked up at this point when he asked me if, even if I didn't consider him my father, I would consider his baby my sibling. I said of course and that I planned to be a very active part in their life if I could, and he started crying and asked me if he could hug me, and this time I agreed. I am happy about the resolution of our conversation, and I really do believe he will be a good parent for my sibling. Once again, thanks to everyone who commented and took interest in my story. I don't know if I will update again. Then in the comments section, OP elaborated on finding out who has the college money and said, My father has it. I have no idea why my biological mother kept the info from us, but my father stressed that the money was for me. Then OP replied to another comment on the possibility of his mother lying about the money and said, I mean, and I'm just assuming here, but for sure, he is the main provider in the household, and I know he's been giving her all sort of expensive gifts and stuff now that they live together, but that's not my problem and I don't care. I didn't even know about these college funds until yesterday, so whatever happens between those two is honestly their business. As long as my grandparents or my sibling are not affected, he might as well buy her a diamond necklace with it. Then one user commented and said, Your grandparents are great, but should have protected you from your mother better. It was hard for them, and I assure you at every possible turn they have taken my side and have scolded my mother for her treatment towards me, and taken necessary measures about it, even forcing her to go to therapy, and they made it really clear to me explicitly that I was like a son to them, and they wouldn't choose their daughter over me, especially after seeing how she treated me, but it's hard for them because they still love her. And finally, OP elaborated on child support and said, The monthly child support went and still goes to my grandparents. It's the college fund that only she knew about, but that money my father said only he has control over it, but I didn't know it existed and I'm not partially worried about it. I've never considered my father as a provider and I've been making plans about my future in my head without this money, always. And it's nice to know I have this, but now
now, if it weren't here, I would find my way. Update. Next day. So, a lot of you warned me about crap hitting the fan, so to speak. When my biological mother spoke to my father today, that's exactly what happened. My father sent me a text message early in the morning, warning me about the fact that he was going to confront my mother, and that he didn't want anything to splash onto me, and reassured me that he believed me completely. And I braced myself, because I expected for her to call me berating me or something. I truly don't care about what she thinks of me, but these past few days have been emotionally draining, and I wasn't sure if I was ready for another full-blown-out confrontation. Using Reddit to vent has been helpful, though. After a few hours, my mother pulled into our house and let herself in screaming like a madman and calling me every name in the book, saying I had ruined her relationship and asking me why I had been blabbing about private matters that don't concern anybody. I said that my childhood matters to me and my father, who is also going to be the future father of her child, and that her actions ruined her relationship. She called me an a-hole and said I was the biggest effing mistake she's ever done in her life. I didn't know she could still hurt me, but that was a low blow, and I said that I would do anything in my power to take her baby away from her because she was a monster of a mother. We were screaming at this point, and my grandparents who were in the backyard must have heard us and entered the room and separated us and heard part of the fight. I was fighting tears, and my grandma walked me upstairs to my room as my grandpa screamed at my mother, saying how dare she speak to me that way. My grandma soothed me a little and then went to confront my mother with my grandpa. I heard from the door how they ripped my mother a new one. They confronted her for telling me the things that she did, for treating me like garbage all my life, and for lying to my father. They told me how disappointed they were in her, for always treating me with disgust, and how many excuses they made for her thinking she was a child trying to raise a child. But now, she is an adult, and her behavior continued the same. And they said that they were on the path of disinheriting her. My mother was screaming about how hard it has been for her, and how hurt she is, but my grandparents were having none of that. They said that they raised me, and she was allowed to have the life that she wanted, and to take all the decisions she wanted without repercussions ever. And I even heard them say that if there was a custody battle ensuing over the baby to come, they would take the father's side, unless she radically changed everything about her behavior. They went outside for a while, so I don't know what they said, but eventually they came into my room and my grandparents looked extremely serious, and my mother was red and crying, and apologized to me through gritted teeth. I didn't respond, but my grandparents said on her behalf she was going to start therapy immediately, and she was no longer welcome in the house. I called my father after the debacle, and he was furious. He spoke to my mother before going to a work meeting, and he confronted her about everything. Apparently, it was nasty, but he was willing to work on the relationship for the good of the baby, on the condition that my mother would also be working on improving her relationship with me, so that whenever I visited them, I wouldn't feel uncomfortable. After he left, he made her promise she wouldn't contact me until they talked again. But that's my mother for you, folks. I asked him to think on what's better for himself and for the baby, and to not hold today against my mother if he doesn't want to. Also, a thing that has come up a lot in the comments of my previous post is that my progenitors only want me as a babysitter, and that I should steer away from them and the baby for my own sake. But I want to make a point about that. I can't say nothing about their intentions. I know nothing about that. But I'm really very excited to have a sibling. Growing up, I had a very small family. It was just my grandparents and me. On my paternal side, I had a huge family with aunts, uncles, and cousins. But whenever I went there, I always felt like the odd one out. They tried to include me and invited me for Easter, Christmas, barbecues, and stuff like that, but I didn't really know them. And although they were always nice to me, I always felt like I had a big sign on my head that said, That kid that John had in high school! I cannot wait to have a sibling and love them and always be there for them and show them what a family is. I want to be that person that they can always rely on for them, and I want to feel that bond with someone, so even if I have my misgivings about my parents, and I do a lot, I do not about being a big brother. I hope this is the last update, and there is no more family drama in the future. Thank you all for your help. Having this website to air out my frustrations and having a community to back me up and give me feedback has been amazing. And you truly have helped me out a lot to deal with all of this. So really, thank you so much. Update. Four months later. Hi everyone, I posted a few months back about my situation and I just saw someone put my story on TikTok so I decided to check back on this account and saw that I still had some notifications asking for an update. So, here it is. 
Well, first of all, my grandparents are as cool as ever. I have not moved, nor do I intend to. And we spent Christmas together, and it was all great. My father and I have bonded more, and we are in a better place. He is paying for my therapy, and we've done a couple of sessions together, and we are in a much better place. He feels sorry for having lost my childhood years, but understands that cannot get them back. And instead of pushing a relationship with me, he is letting me have my space to build as much of a relationship that I want with him, which takes the pressure off of me, to be honest. We've kind of bonded over my little sister. We found out it's going to be a girl, and I helped him paint the nursery and build the furniture, which I enjoyed a lot. He and my egg donor are at a bit of a weird situation. They live together, but they're not together. My father is extremely angry about everything that she did and said to me when I was little, and about what I related in my previous post, and he is weary about what kind of person she is going to be with my baby sister. They are going to couples therapy and individual therapy, and although I see her at a passing because I go sometimes to my father's house, she is just barely polite with me, and I can tell that she feels like I'm the one who screwed up her opportunity to play house with her second baby. I try to pay her no mind, but the only thing that worries me is if she actually is going to poison my little sister's mind against me, or subject her to a similar treatment like she did to me, because she is also going to be born around all of this tension. The silver lining, though, is that everyone else is showing up for my little sister, and that means I've also connected more with my father's side of the family. They've always been kind to me, but I always felt weird around them, but now that things with my father seem to be settling into a bit more comfortable way, I feel like I belong into his family more and I can hang out with my cousins and aunts and uncles more. Sorry if it's not much of an update, but here's how things lay at the moment. Update, five months later. So it's been a while, but recent developments have brought me back here to give you all a bit of an update. First of all, thank you everyone who has messaged me and shown me that my situation and I are on their minds. It helps a lot. Me and my father have been developing a stronger relationship and we've become quite close, although I still have some barriers up. My egg donor has been giving me the cold shoulder for the remaining of the pregnancy, and my father was considering whether or not to try and continue the relationship. This brings us to present times. They had a daughter named Ella, who is the most beautiful, charming, and cute baby I have ever seen. My father was ecstatic when she was being delivered and asked me if I wanted to remain in the hospital during the labor, which I happily agreed. It was amazing to see my sister for the first time, and me and my father both cried while holding her. My egg donor, on the other hand, looked at her with little care and tried to pass her off to whoever was around so she wouldn't have to hold her. The relationship of my parents at this moment was on thin ice, but the maternal spirit that my mother thought she would develop with this child never materialized. When they got home, they received dozens of visits from relatives and friends and my dad had to take care of everything because my egg donor refused to even be near the baby. Doctors are worried she must have been suffering from postpartum depression, but she refuses to accept help or counseling. I tried to be more gentle to her these days to ease her mental state, but things just got worse. It all came to a head a few days ago when my father went to do the groceries and saw on the nanny cam that the egg donor was cursing at Ella, and by the time he made it home, my mother was actually slapping the baby. My father got furious, and she just responded by saying something along the lines of, These kids are trying to keep us apart. We should get rid of them. My father called the police and had my mother forcibly taken to have a psych evaluation. I rushed to his side when I got wind of it. Luckily, my sister is alright. While my egg donor was in the psych evaluation, my father decided that she could no longer live under the same roof as her, and she had to take my sister away from her mother. I came up with the plan that, when my mother was released, she could go rest and start treatment at my grandparents, while I moved in with my father for a while to help him out and avoid drama. Ironically, all of this started because I didn't want to live with my dad, and now that's where I am. My grandparents keep me updated on my egg donor's progress. There are days where she feels truly ashamed of what she did and wants to go back to my dad. Others where she is lethargic and non-responsive, and others where she seems happy and content and talks about a clean state. There would be a court proceeding over the custody of Ella, but we've gotten some sort of emergency ruling granting my dad full custody at the moment. Anyway, things are a bit of a mess, and I wish things hadn't turned out the way they have. Hopefully, I will still be able to be around my sister, and whatever is happening to my egg donor can be addressed so she can get better. My grandparents are so destroyed with all that is happening with their daughter, and they are having a hard time trying to cope, but they come nearly every day to check in on Ella and I, which is nice. 
My dad is also very distraught, and even though he is now categorically rejecting the idea of ever getting back together with the egg donor, he still feels sad to see how a mother can treat her baby, and he is mourning the relationship and the life he thought he would have. On my part, I've been busy with school, and even though I try to understand that my mother is sick, I can't seem to forgive her for what she's done to Ella. If this was her first incident of being negligent or violent, I might be more understanding, but I feel like she is going to be as toxic to my sister as she has always been to me, and I don't want her near us for a second. Whoa, okay guys, do you feel that? Something is very wrong and off balance here. The therapy didn't work. That's all I do is just recommend therapy, and it didn't work for the mom. But on a serious note, she definitely needs something way more than that. That's why she went to the psych ward. And I just got to give props to OP. We've gotten a few of these stories from the perspective of, you know, the kid who's 14, 15, 16, 17, who just grew up in a really bad household, was thrown off to the grandparents, you know, the 16 and young parents. And OP, I mean, is handling it like a champ. And the grandparents just stellar for what they've done. They even said, like, they didn't feel like they needed to be thanked because they were just doing, like, what's normal, what's expected of them, taking care of family. Everything for everyone seems to be going in the right direction except for the mother, which stands as a roadblock for literally everyone involved in this story, unfortunately. So, like, even if OP and, you know, the egg donor don't repair their relationship 100%, at least I'm hoping it can get to be somewhere stable. That's probably the bare minimum that you can hope for. But anyway, next story. Oh, wait, no, we're done. I lied to you guys. I know it's the end of the video because my throat hurts again. But anyway, guys, thank you all so much for watching. We had some sad stories today, didn't we? But you know what? I always ended on a positive note. I hope you have a really good day. I really like your t-shirt. I like your pants, to be honest. And bye-bye.